Hi, my name's Vince Sheehan, and today I'd like to talk about Brahms's first piano concerto in D minor. And I'd like to go through this great work, exploring how it's put together. I do believe that having some understanding of structure in classical music can greatly aid our appreciation and enjoyment of it. It's such a great skill to be at a performance or listening to a recording and knowing where you are in the music, and that's why I do these videos. Now Brahms began writing this in 1854 as a young man, recently under the sway of Robert and Clara Schumann, who, uh, who recognised his genius. But Brahms, to begin with, wanted uh, to write a sonata for two pianos. He then realised that much of the music had a substantial weight behind it, and he thought maybe this music should be a symphony instead, his first symphony. Um, and despite progressing much with that, particularly in the first movement, he then decided to start again using some of the music, but then turning it into a piano concerto. And that's ultimately what he arrived at uh, when he finished the work in 1858. It received its premiere, this being Brahms's first uh, proper orchestral work in 1859, but sadly it didn't go well. Um, there was another performance in Leipzig, which, uh, despite being performed well apparently with Brahms at the piano, uh, it was hissed at by the audience, which uh, quite understandably upset Brahms a lot. But then on its third performance in Leipzig, the work was rapturously received, and uh, since then it's just become a staple of the, uh, of the repertoire. And of course, it's one of the greatest concertos ever written. And um, there's something titanic, mighty, craggy, incredibly powerful and moving about this first piano concerto by Brahms. It's said to uh, be inspired by Beethoven's Ninth, which of course shares the same key. Brahms had heard that a few years before he was working on this. And it's also perhaps inspired by, sadly, very tragically, by Schumann's attempted suicide. Uh, you can read all about that, you know, online or whatever, but I'd like to just focus on the music and how it's put together. The concerto's in three movements, as you'd expect. The first movement is this titanic piece in sonata form, with uh, no less than three distinct subjects. And uh, as is usual with concerti by this time in the Romantic period, we have a lengthy orchestral introduction, an orchestral exposition, which outlines many of the themes we're going to hear in the second exposition with the soloist. So ex orchestral exposition, exposition with the soloist, development, recapitulation and coda. That's how it goes. The exact form could be found below with bar numbers. And the first subject is unforgettable. It begins like this with the orchestra. such an opening of confidence. Brahms is almost pulling the rug under our feet, it's a bit like what uh, Beethoven did before him. We know the concertos in D minor, we have a D in the bass, but then Brahms throws in a B flat chord. It seems to start in the wrong key. <laughs> uh, fantastic. We then move to a transition idea in the orchestral exposition, a very beautiful tune. Uh, Brahms takes uh, a motif from the opening, which he then puts into the accompaniment in the, the cellos. And over the top we have this lovely melody. 
and the first violins. that major minor at the end there. Um, that transition takes us to the second subject where we're going to a very remote key, B flat minor. Remember we're in D minor to begin with and now we're in here. Okay. And uh, this melody is so mysterious, so beautiful, like the mists rising from a lake at dawn. Really lovely. We hear this idea on the firsts and the wings. We're then brought back to the tonic with a bump, back to the dramatic music of the opening for a codetta. What I love about here, it's got this uh, canonic texture going on here. The violins playing the main melody. Uh, and we have even the horns coming in at a different point, uh, point. The same melody overlapping three times. Very exciting. And we have this new idea in the codetta, which the piano will pick up on soon. Um, I love this, it's such, such passionate music. gets me every time. Then we get to the uh, exposition proper with the soloist and um, with such a mighty opening you'd be forgiven for thinking that the piano is going to come crashing in you know like Grieg's concerto or something but no comes in in a wistful gentle way with a new theme derived from what we've just heard in the codetta. Mozart does a similar thing in his concerto in D minor number 20 <laughs> Really lovely. You can count this idea as uh, an additional tune in the first subject group. The, um, the pianist then eventually comes back to the main uh, tragic idea of the opening. We then hear the transition idea again, which we heard in the, the orchestral exposition, before we move into F minor for the second subject, this time on the piano in a beautifully uh, romantic way. For we finally hit the relative major with what most people call the second subject but I, I think the previous idea that mysterious romantic idea is so distinct I regard this uh, new tune as the third subject and the piano comes in with this powerful and noble theme <laughs> Soon hear this other idea. Which is picked up by the horns at the end of this um, subject group. Uh, which then takes us to a codetta based on that mysterious uh, second subject idea. But now uh, on the oboe and in the major mode. The piano then has this flurry of notes in, in octaves and we come to the development. And the development for this movement is actually rather short, perfectly proportioned, but rather short compared to the uh, exposition and recapitulation. It's based largely around the, the uh, first idea, of course. As you'd expect, it travels through different keys. We hear the transition idea as well. Etc. 
And there's a new idea as well in the development, uh, which we hear when put the violins first, goes like this, to lead us back eventually into the recapitulation. And we then come to, I think, it's got to be one of the most exciting passages in all of Brahms's music. It's as if the orchestra and piano uh, have come to loggerheads. Uh, the clashing of horns, if you like. A real heavyweight boxing match. We've got the orchestra going. And then the piano's playing uh, chords in the gap. So exciting. Dum, da 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 dum, da da da. Etc. Ah, this is going to be one of the most thrilling entrances to any. Uh, recapitulation from the development. Absolutely love it. We have then at the first subject of course we have a transition which is different from the one in the expositions. Uh, we have a return to the piano entry this time on the violins. Again I love this moment. <laughs> Transition then takes us to the second subject, this time in F sharp minor, for we have that wonderfully noble theme again. The third subject, this time in D major. And so on. Hearing those horn calls again, and the music dies away, and we're into a fiery, passionate coda based on the first subject. The adagio is a beautiful movement in ternary form with the coda. The A section has this descending theme first introduced on the bassoons and the violins. said that Brahms in an early manuscript wrote uh, the words to the Benedictus from uh, the Mass to this melody, perhaps a prayer for Schumann. <laughs> Brahms meant by inscribing those words to this melody. Um, it's certainly a very beautiful way to start this slow movement. And the piano really meditates on that tune, developing it in its own way. Near the end of this section the music seems to be moving on in terms of modulation and the piano starts playing something like this. that takes us to the B section which is in B minor to begin with. And then we come to I think one of the most beautiful moments in the whole concerto. These clarinets come in with this beautiful theme. The 
music swells in emotion and passion before the music returns to the opening descending Benedictus theme. This time of the addition of a cadenza. The cadenza, if you remember, was missing from the first movement, but there is um, a short cadenza here. And then we have a solemn coda based on that descending uh, idea from the beginning of the movement to round this uh, beautiful movement off. The last movement, the rondo, is very much inspired by the finale of Beethoven's third piano concerto. And please check out my video on that work as well, if you'd like. It's a sonata rondo. Um, basically, um, a theme that comes back, but with um, a development section, a mixture between sonata form and a normal rondo. And the theme that keeps coming back, the A theme, uh, is this uh, stirring idea. And the way the piano plays this at the beginning of this rondo movement is um, very much uh, contrapuntal in the style of Bach you know, perhaps like one of his inventions or something. We then reach the B section, which goes like this. Very amiable, charming tune. Um, we're then back to the A section again. before we come into a new section, the C section, which contains uh, a new theme, but also a, a development. And the new theme is this lovely theme in B flat major. And the piano is playing this. Da, 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 da. Uh, off the beat in um, a really lovely way. We then come to this rather studious sounding um, fugal section, which uh, is based on the main theme of the rondo, uh, which you first hear in the second violins. really love this bit actually of the concerto, uh, really exciting and uh, you know that that fugal idea of course is outlines them which is the the main theme of the rondo. The piano then breaks free of this uh, counterpoint in this wonderfully uh, romantic and free way and uh, inevitably we come back to the uh, to D minor to the, uh, the A theme, the rondo theme. Um, we then hear the second theme again, this time in D minor. The pianist then has a brief uh, cadenza before we come into the coda. And the codas are lovely at way to end this concerto with horns, plenty of horns, very Schumann-esque. Um, you can really hear the, the influence of his mentor here behind this music. A bit later on in the coda, we kind of get these oboes chattering away like they're at a country dance um, with the bassoon playing the dum 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 now in D major before the music goes up again near the end for a, a fantastically uh, fast and um, thrilling close to this uh, wonderful concerto. And I'd just like to thank Adam Tokac um, suggesting that I cover this at work and if you have any suggestions for pieces you'd like me to analyse please put them in the comments below. Um, I'll do my best to get to them and of course please click like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Bye.